Hello everybody, my name is James Piper, I'm a senior fellow in acute medicine and clinical lecturer here at the medical school. I'd like to welcome you to your introduction and orientation module. This is a brief video on the theory behind uh, venipuncture, which is one of the clinical skills you're going to be covering in IOM week. If you have any questions, you can email me at james.piper uh, at ucl.ac.uk and I look forward to meeting some of you at the Royal Free. I'm going to talk about um, aseptic non-touch technique in venipuncture, needle stick policy, common sites of venipuncture, venipuncture technique, correct blood bottles, blood cultures and competencies. Just to remind you there is also an, um, a venipuncture manual which I have revised and updated for you uh, in time for this year and this will also be available up on Moodle. There's also the clinical skills videos on the UCL clinical skills website on YouTube. So why is venipuncture useful? Well, it can be useful to diagnose conditions alongside history and examination. You can monitor responses to therapy and adverse effects such as uh, digoxin levels, uh, renal toxicity and liver function tests, and in drug overdose such as paracetamol and salicylates. It can be useful in perioperative and critical care monitoring such as um, serial lactate measurement. Disease screening such as um, CA125 which is used for ovarian cancer and sickle cell disease. You can also monitor for a recurrence. As you start to embark further and further in your clinical education it's important to appreciate about how we learn clinical skills in the first place and this is Dreyfus's model of skill acquisition by the team uh, from in California from 1980. So this is important to appreciate that for some clinical skills um, you'll now be competent, for others you'll only just be beginning. For some of you, you will have already um, done venipuncture training in um, other forms, um, but some of you, or most of you, will be a novice, i.e. you're going to learn how to learn, to do, then to teach. So it's important at this stage to appreciate that you are just a novice. And that it's important that you adhere to the strict rules uh, that govern venipuncture and that you follow the protocol which we're going to outline in your clinical skill sessions. It might be that you have feel reluctant or hesitant about performing a new practical skill and my job is to helpfully give you the confidence and support that you need um, for you to do venipuncture and do it well. So it's important to remember that um, when you do venipuncture uh, that you use your aseptic non-touch technique and that you must not touch any of the key parts. So for example in a needle and syringe it would obviously be this, the needle, syringe um, and the syringe hub. Key parts are those parts or sites that if contaminated will increase the risk of infection. So to do ANTT for venipuncture, the first step is the preparation zone and that's when you want to clean your hands with out and then using alcohol, hand rub or soap and water. You then want to clean the tray with a detergent wipe and rinse any residue and dry the tray. You're going to gather all the venipuncture equipment that you need and you're going to prepare the equipment protecting key parts using the non-touch technique. In the patient zone, you're going to apply disposable tourniquet and palpate the vein. Clean your hands again with soap and water uh, or alcohol hand rub. Then apply non-sterile gloves and clean the skin. Access the patient's vein protecting key parts and sites using a non-touch technique. If you are successful and collect the blood samples that you require, you're then going to go into the decontamination zone where you're going to dispose of sharps and equipment, clean the tray, dispose the gloves and then clean your hands again. There are three important tenets of preventing a needle stick injury. The first one is safe preparation by use of gloves, considering eye protection, masks and apron. Masks are currently mandatory on most NHS sites as well as using your ANTT to protect the patient from any healthcare associated infection. Safe handling of needles including never resheathing needles or bending them and that if you are struggling to access the veins to take blood samples then you should call for help. It's also important to safely dispose of any equipment, never leave exposed sharps and to use the sharps bin for disposal. 
So for those of you who are going to be studying at the Royal Free, this is the needle stick policy. And this is probably the same apart from the phone number which will apply to all trusts. So basically you must ensure that any needle stick injury or accidents must be reported to your immediate supervisor. If there is a risk of splash, consider wearing eye protection and a visor. Contact the needle stick hotline, which is for Royal Free 020 7794 That's 020 7794 There's also a needle stick hotline, as I've just said. Complete the incident datix form, and if you're on nights or out of hours, and you must attend the emergency department for assessment. The occupational health team have also asked me to remind you that even if you see the emergency department overnight or out of hours for a needle stick assessment, you must still get in touch uh, with occupational health um, as soon as you have an opportunity to. So this applies to you all regardless of sight. So uh, immediate action after a needle stick injury is if you have any mouth, eyes, nose are involved, then wash thoroughly with water. If the skin is punctured, encourage bleeding and wash with soap and water. Do not suck, scrub, puncture, uh, sub, scrub the puncture or use antiseptic agents. Cover with the dressing and report immediately for risk assessment by a qualified practitioner. So risk assessment should be done independently. So i.e. this is the, the risk of you contracting a blood borne virus from the patient or the other way around. So therefore it's important to do this to protect you and the patient and to do this independently. You want to know the circumstances of the exposure, percutaneous, mucous membranes, deep superficial, blood body fluid involved and the type of device which caused the needle stick the infection status of the staff and the patient, and you may be required to give blood samples for save and screen. A member of the medical team may screen the source patient, but this should not be done by you, i.e. you should make sure that this, the processes are separate and you should not approach the patient if um, there is a needle stick accident. So to have a look at the venous anatomy now, you can see here on the left side, these are the major veins in which you may take venipuncture from. And these include the median cubital vein, basilic vein, capalic vein, and brachial vein. You'll notice, however, on the right hand side that there are these, the ulnar artery and the radial artery that run in tandem. And it's important uh, in your practice this, that you feel for a pulse around the area which you're planning to venipuncture to exclude the risk of um, arterial puncture, which can cause significant bleeding and bruising. Also be mindful of the patient's um, running nerves. It's important to be mindful of the musculocutaneous nerve, which covers all muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm, the median nerve, which covers most flexors in the forearm, and the thenar muscles in the hand. The radial nerve, which covers all muscles in the posterior compartment of the arm. Patients who receive an accidental needle um, scratch to the nerve can cause a lightning pain down the arm. And so if you're taking blood and a patient complains of immediate shooting like pain, then you should pull back the needle and withdraw. So where should you avoid taking blood? So you should avoid taking blood in veins that are fibrosed, inflamed and fragile. Those are bruised, areas of uh, infected skin and tissue side of a stroke, mastectomy or axillary node clearance because of the risk of lymphedema, areas affected by disabling disease, limbs with IV or subcutaneous infusions because of the risk of contamination and incorrect readings, fistulas, arterial venous malformations and coagulopathy. So for skill acquisition you need to watch the video prior to the session you need to watch the demo, which we'll do on IOM day. Explanation, confirmation of understanding and practice. So what you now need to do is go to YouTube search and search for UCL clinical skills and watch the venipuncture video with a vacutainer and the video with a butterfly. It's important that, to, that you should communicate and consent your patients prior to doing any procedure. And so you should confirm the patient's identity before taking the blood samples. Cross check this information with the patient's wristband and the blood test request. Most laboratories need handwritten labels, although many now are printed off and forms for blood blank. 
uh, you'll need to handwrite any request for group and save or cross match but this should be done by someone who's qualified and trained in blood sample collection for blood transfusion. Label the blood tubes before leaving the patient's bedside. Venipuncture is straightforward and minimally invasive, however sometimes for patients who have had multiple blood tests or difficult veins it might be uncomfortable and you should tell the patient about potential complications, i.e. Uh, bruising, bleeding and formation of a bruise which is the most common. Sometimes it is possible that you'll cause local infection although this is rare if ANTT is applied and also arterial puncture and the possibility that you may not be able to get the sample. This is especially important at the beginning as you're just learning to um, become competent in the technique. This is the ANTT procedure again for venipuncture. So when you have your blood bottles, you have, these are blood culture bottles on the left, an EDTA tube on the left, a um, SST tube, and then you have coag tube, glucose, and pig tube. And on the right hand side is a blood gas. There is an explanation of all the different blood bottles at uh, https geekymedics.com forward slash blood bottles guide forward slash. It's important that you draw the blood in a correct order. And so these are the uh, blood culture bottles first, plain tube in red, citrate in blue, SST or serum separator tube which is yellow or gold, heparin tube, EDTA tube which is in purple, or glycoly glycolysis inhibitor tube or oxalate or fluoride and that's a grey tube and then any other tubes although it's unlikely that you'll use any other tubes apart from these in day-to-day -day clinical practice and the heparin tube tends to have a green top. So what do all the different um, colour coded bottles mean? So for red bottles we usually perform virology samples, serology PCR such as an HIV test, minerals, antigens and vitamin D levels. In the light blue top we can perform a coagulation screen, INR and D-dimer. In the purple tube we can perform haematology tests such as for blood count, blood film, ESR and HbA1c. Yellow is the biochemistry and where you can form urea and electrolytes, most bi biochemistry tests, bone profile, troponins, thyroid function tests and the CRP. Pink topped blood bottles are for group and safe and cross match and for hemolysis screening. The grey also is to measure glucose and some trusts uh, use grey bottles to measure serum lactate. So blood cultures are used to detect bacteremia or fungemias. It's important to identify microorganisms and perform antibiotic sensitivities so that we know our patients are on the right antibiotics. You're going to take the blood cultures when there's a clinical need such as sepsis and you should not take them if there's no intention to treat any organisms found. So for example if the patient is receiving palliative care. What's important to note about blood cultures is that there is a high risk of sample contamination um, and you, this can obviously cause um, quite significant issues for the trust. You must perform meticulous ANTT when doing blood cultures and the patient's skin must be decontaminated thoroughly. When you do blood cultures you should see, super clean the site. You may need to use soup and water even before you use an alcohol wipe on where you're planning to take the blood from. If blood is being collected for other tests, it's always important to inoculate the blood culture bottles first. You should use an alcohol wipe to clean the tops of the culture bottles to decontaminate them, and you usually fill the anaerobic bottle first. Blood culture volume is the most significant factor affecting the detection of organisms, so make sure the sample is large enough with about 5 or so mils. And ideally, if your patient is septic, then you want to collect the blood before antibiotics commence. So just a couple of pearls for you for when you go out and start to learn how to practice. You can take blood from a cannula immediately before connecting any infusions. However, you should never take blood from lines in use or from infusion arms. If a patient is very anxious or has fainted during venipuncture previously, then ask them to lie down when having their blood taken. Do not ask the patient to clench their fist to make a vein more visible. This can actually affect the test results causing what's known as pseudo hyperkalemia or a fake high potassium. If the patient is taking anticoagulants then you should apply a pressure to the venipuncture site for about 10 minutes and you should avoid femoral puncture. Again this is only usually done by experienced doctors. 
So what should you do next? So having watched this video, you should now go and watch the skills videos. You should attend your allocated Venipuncture IOM sessions, and I suggest you bring your logbooks with you. Practice in a mannequin where you'll be assessed by my colleagues and myself and be deemed lab competent if you are appropriate. You can then practice on each other with consent and supervised, and again, this must be supervised by faculty. And you should aim to achieve full competency by taking supervised opportunities. Some of you will achieve this quicker than others. It's not a race and it's important to remember that each, each of you will learn and adapt to a different skill individually and in your own time. It is far better for you and for your patients that you take the time necessary to practice because it can take quite a long time to actually be competent and good at venipuncture on a variety of patients. So here are some references. There's a fairly short learning module on uh, learning BMJ. There's the Geeky Medics website, and also um, this is a phlebotomy handbook from the World Health Organization. The link there is at the bottom. If you have any questions, you can obviously ask your IOM venipuncture tutor, the teaching fellows and the skills team. So good luck on your learning, on, a, on your journey of learning a new skill. I'll see some of you at the Royal Free and at the Royal Free IOM. My email address is james.piper, P-I-P-E-R, at ucl.ac.uk. Good luck and welcome to your clinical years.